Welcome to Audience First, a podcast for tech marketers looking to break out of the echo chamber to better understand their audience and turn them into loyal customers. Every week, Danny Wolf has brutally honest conversations with busy tech buyers about what really motivates them, the things they hate that vendors do, and what you can do about it. Get access to practical information on how to build authentic relationships with your audience. Listen to and talk with your buyers and apply real customer insights to your strategies and tactics. You owe it to the world to unmute your mic. Are you ready? Welcome to another episode of Audience First. As always, I have a very special guest with me today. Today, Brian Hogley is in the house. Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How are you? I'm well. I'm well. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Yeah, for sure. So, Brian, tell me, who are you? What do you do? And why the hell do you do it? Oh, man. Uh, So, I think deep down, I'm just... I'm a problem solver. I like solving problems. I hate being bored. And I got a knack for computers when I was a kid. And I just saw them as a big puzzle. And I just really, truly enjoy solving puzzles and and figuring out. I like being challenged. So, you know, um, you've kind of stick to something you're good at and you see it through. And, And this has been kind of my journey is just focusing on you know, IT initially and, and security. I always really liked security of of computers and systems. And, and you know, I took it from being a kid and my uncle taught me quite a bit. And then um, just grew up doing that, went through the army, went through 10 years in the DC area, working for a number of different agencies, became the CISO for a Fortune 500 and launched my own company, Side Channel, to, fo- again, continue solving problems, focus on an underserved market, and we took the company public through a, uh, a, a reverse merger and a takeover of another company back in July of 2022. And, you know, now problem solving on a different, on a different level and looking at kind of different platforms and ways to help clients and grow a business and, and hire really interesting people and give them opportunities to, to again, be problem solvers and, and focus on solutions. So I think that's kind of the, I guess that's the best kind of byline for for me on uh, on why do I do it and what am I doing? I love it, and it's it's really you know I've been going through a bunch of the insights that I've uh, gathered this past year, and when I ask people why they do what they do and why are they why are they in the cybersecurity industry, most of them are saying that they they just like to solve problems and they like a challenge. I think mm-hmm. that it really resonates with me too because. I like to bite off more than I can chew, and I love a good challenge. And so I think uh, that's kind of like a a great intrinsic motivate, like a re- great intrinsic motivation. That that feeling of of achievement once you solve a challenge, I feel like, is something that really drives people in this industry. So that's great. Yeah, I think you, you've got that, and you. I think the people who who do really well in this industry are people who are open minded, who who obviously like being problem solvers and are open-minded about how to solve problems. They're not so regimented with like, oh, I did it here last time. I'm, I can't do it any other way because I saw success via that path. That's the only way it can be done. But you also, you also have, I think security itself benefits from people who really have a protection mindset. Like people who genuinely want to protect good things. They want to protect things as they were built. They, you know, like think about how law enforcement works or the military, right? Like those people go into that and have a mindset of like, uh, my job is to protect someone or something, right? Or, or, you know, whatever. security has that really good security practitioners have that same type of thinking. Because if you don't, you kind of miss what you're doing. You'd be really good at something. You are really problem solving. But, you know, if, if you, if the core of what you're doing isn't around protection, of an asset or something, then I I don't know. I feel like people kind of who don't have, because I've seen it, I've seen people really passionate and really into it, but they just don't have that protective mindset. And it's like, you're missing that edge that others have. So I would add that that's a kind of an important quality and trait within this space. I love it. So right now, well, in your time working in the cybersecurity industry, what have you found? Well, let me kind of rephrase that. 
what do you hate most about the cybersecurity industry? Um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's not a short list. Um, we, it's a toss up between people who sell bullshit and people who have a pure auditor's mindset on how to approach building and, and addressing risk. And I think what I'm trying to do is never do that because I, I, the people I square off against the most when I'm trying to build a program or talk to people about risk are those two folks, right? And let's kind of maybe break down both of them. So, you know, it's not like, oh, vendors are bad. I'm a vendor. Like I, we built a product. I built two products that I sell. We sell a service. Like I'm squarely in the vendor can. In fact, when I was the CISO for a Fortune 500, guess what? The company I worked for was technically a vendor to people. Like everybody's a vendor. So it's not, this is not vendor bashing by any means. But the way that certain vendors approach selling a product or selling a solution, there are some real misses. And I can tell the people that I've bought from are people who acted one way over people who acted another. For instance, like you were privy to um, an online uh, spat I had with the CEO of of another company and like whatever whatever that was right and maybe I didn't take the highest road in that conversation but when you when you don't do your homework on who you're going to talk to about why you even want to have a conversation it's akin to bumping into somebody at a bar and and starting the conversation with like well what's your name okay what do you do blah 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 let me find out about you Every conversation you ever have with somebody is about, let me find out about you. And if someone's like, hey, I'm not interested, take the hint, walk away, move on. Thousands of other, millions of other people in the world. Um, so vendors, I think, have an issue with being able to take that time sometimes. And that is negative to them. And unfortunately, amplifies and becomes negative on vendors as a whole. And that is unfair, but that's unfortunately the truth, right? Um, I also think the way that we, some people weave the wrong aspects of security in, from marketing into the sales message or the product or service message, for instance, like, and, and, and this is, again, me being a little, like, this is Brian's way of how you build programs, but I feel like I've done a pretty good job of building security programs and proving to, like, how you do it and they work. So I'm very control-based. But I'm not compliance based. And this kind of like hits the second point of like the auditor mindset. Building a program on frameworks and controls does not mean I'm building a compliance based program. It means I'm using a guide of good techniques and processes. I got into another conversation the other day about DOD zero trust uh, initiatives. And, and a fellow was like, this is going to be a compliance framework and like it's going to fail. The DOD is going the wrong way. I'm like, and all he kept saying was like, well, the methodology, we need a methodology around zero trust. I'm like, I felt like in Tigo Montoya, like you keep using that word, but I don't think you know what it means. Um, methodologies rely on processes and techniques to show what you're doing has, a, has an output, an expected output. Mm -hmm. Control frameworks to building programs are those things. Those are those activities, those tests, the things that you should be looking at, the guide, if you will. It's not saying you have to, compliance is you have to do all of these perfectly. Using a methodology is you should follow some of this stuff. These are best practices and guides. I'm not telling you you have to do all of them. It's a guide. It's a framework. You, a methodology is walking through that framework. So back to why does this like hit me on the vendor side? Nobody cares about reducing your mean time to breach by 17% over the last six months. I've never had a board conversation. I've never had a client. I've never had a, a director, an investor ever ask that. And there are some vendors out there who are very heavy on that message. And that's not a KPI that a lot of people care about or know, except for maybe a few. And those people have very, very mature programs. Mm -hmm. But that's like the Fortune 50. The rest of us mortals who operate in, <laughs> in, you know, reality don't care about that KPI. We care about, are we building a good program based on something? Well, what is that something? It's not just Brian's, this feels this feels right. Let's go do this. You know, you can't do that. You have to build it on something. So when vendors lack the ability to like, tell me what their product or solution does against a control framework, especially a framework that I'm trying to build a program to, let's take a take NIST, not a, 
no secret, I'm a huge NIST fanboy, right? Wrote a book on it. Like, I love the cybersecurity framework. It's a good methodology. It's a good framework to follow, but it's not prescriptive in any way. It's a good guide. If I tell you as a client, you're my vendor, I'm building a program based on this. Wouldn't it behoove you to tell me what your product or solution does to help me meet those one or two or handful of the 108 controls that are in that? Because that's what I'm trying to build to. It's like I built, I'm trying to build a house. Great. What kind of wood should I use? Well, Southern Florida is going to have different requirements than Maine. It's the same thing. I'm not telling you you have to use pine. I'm saying you have to build this house out of something. What's going to be the best thing for where you are, what you're trying to build? But nobody's coming at that, at that conversation that way. And that's the, that's the part I hate. I can't have conversations with vendors that can come talk to me about what their products do, aligning to the program I'm trying to build. All I hear is, this product reduces mean time to breach by 17%. We have 100% visibility to blah, blah, blah. It's like, I don't know, man. That's what you're saying is not what I'm asking. Thank mm -hmm. you. Mm -hmm. The second piece is the auditor framework. We can't be black and white. The whole thinking of like, this has to be compliance. This has to be this. Compliance is a great baseline to start from and build from. It's a good guide. A lot of, because a lot of compliance frameworks now have finally caught up to where security kind of was pushing, you know, five, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But we can't think black and white. We have to have risk management. Like we have to be able to make decisions. We have to be able to say, I will accept this risk because we financially can't afford to close it right now. But I can do these things, mitigate this risk down to a low enough level that allow me to accept it. Any reasonable person, and I'll pull on the lawyer speak for a second, would look at that and go, you did the right thing. You financially couldn't close it, but you did something else that, that was compensating and reduced the risk. Auditor mindset would throw all of that and be like, you're not doing the control as stated. Fail. You can't. It's like, it's a, that's a no-win game. That mm -hmm. is, there is a zero win in that. In, in that. And we need to people's thinking around and away from this auditor, pure black and white view. Hell, I can't believe I just said that because I got, I got somebody kicked me the other day because I said that. I'm like, that's not, come on. It's yes or no. It's binary, right? It's, it's on or off. It's black and white. These are terms as old as time. Um, those two things are the things that I, I just can't stand that our, our industry keeps doing. And it's not helping our industry as a whole. If we continue both of these aspects and conversations and thinking, because all of us, I don't know if you see this, we think we're all pretty cool for what we do in this space. Cybersecurity is pretty freaking cool. It's damn near magic, right? I mean, above and beyond what IT is. Like we have a superpower because we actually understand this and can see something on a logical plane. And that screws us sometimes because we think we're that cool. The rest of the world thinks of us as IT geeks. And if we keep talking like auditors and we keep talking about KPIs that don't matter to anybody, we're going to continue to be treated like that. So the continuation of those two things are what the, the top two. I have a short list of others, but like those yep. are the top two. And that's a, that's a big, I think that's a big problem for us because mm -hmm. I don't think either one of those are really benefiting anybody. Um, in any valuable way to continue kind of those two, those two thought trains. Why do you think the industry is behaving this way or catching on to these or sticking to these mindsets, if you will? The one, it's the easy. first one, the first one is the naughty behavior and just being, yeah. being a dick. The second one is the auditor's mindset. Yeah. I, I think it's because it's easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, people tend to do what's easy, right. And do what you know, right. You've got a lot of people who have been auditors or are used to being audited and are just like, well, the easiest thing to do is just co totally comply with these controls. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no thinking in, in, in coming up with a mitigating uh, uh, control or mitigating or, or remediation in, in a way. It also takes a lot of thought and, and process to figure out and justify, right? Like to come up with a justification statement about why I couldn't address this risk but I did this thing instead, you know, like that's a, that could be a short novel, 
right? It could be, mm-hmm. there's a lot of work that needs to go into telling that story about why we didn't do this, but we chose to do this instead, but it's not equal. It's a little, it's worth a little less, but it gets us something, mm-hmm. right? The alternative is, is, well, we just don't do it when we fail that control. And now we're yeah. totally open and that exposed. So I think the path of least resistance is do what's easiest. Compliance is easy. Let's just go do that, right? It's, it's out of the box. The marketing piece, again, it takes a lot of work for you to figure out what your product actually does against a standard or yeah. a control set or a framework. There's a lot of work that goes into that. And you know, believe it or not, like I built a whole product where we've done this. And I'm not here to pitch that product, but what I learned about how many vendors don't know what their product actually does against a control framework is mind boggling. And, and this is the thing that I don't understand. We talk about in one side of the industry, how important it is to build to a standard, whether it's ISO or NIST or meeting HIPAA compliance or going after your SOC too. And I'm sure the, you know, well, actually crowd out there listening to this will pitchforks and, and torches <laughs> uh, me and I don't care, bring it. Um, about how to build a program, what to build a program on. Okay. Mm-hmm. You give me any standard and I can build you a program based on that standard. Give me any compliance and I, we can, you can rise above the compliance component and build a program based on that. It, this mm-hmm. is not magic. We have one part of our industry, CISOs predominantly, right? Our job is to build programs based on something. Again, not just this feels right. Yeah. Okay. But then on the other side of the industry, you have all the products and solutions that you need To address all those controls, no one's telling you what their product does against those controls. Well, not nobody, but like, it's, it's, it's not all, and it's not most it's, it's a small group. And yeah, so that there's a disconnect there, right? There's a massive disconnect there between product providers, solution providers, and the people building programs, looking at those products. How do I know if I'm building the right thing? Again, I don't want to go purchase something because it reduced my mean time to breach by 17%. Yeah. I have no way to even, I'm not building up, no one, there is no control out there that says do that. Mm -hmm. How do you propose or what are some prescriptive steps that uh, product teams, marketers and salespeople as well could take to one, you know, we could split it, split split this question into two. One, uh, how do you propose the marketers and salespeople uh, pair the messaging to the better pair the messaging to the controls and to the frameworks? And how do you also propose the product teams better pair the products and the way that the functions and the features work to the um, uh, controls? So again, we'll break that into two because I know that's a huge, those are some huge questions. So the marketing groups first, right? And I'll I'll ask this, just make sure I'm hitting the right question. Mm -hmm. Um, Learn cybersecurity control frameworks, learn frameworks, learn standards. Learn how people build programs. Mm -hmm. Don't just look at the product and go, oh, okay, how can I sell this? Right? Like, put your product down. Go learn what a GRC analyst does. Go learn what a CISO does. I'm not expecting you to be a CISO or GRC analyst. But crack open, you know, a white paper and read what programs we're building them to. Go learn about compliance language. If anybody wants to get ahead in the SEC stuff that's about to come out in the United States, People should be pouring over those words, but nobody does. Why? Because it's difficult. Most people are like, oh, someone else will read that. Nobody else is reading it. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, nobody else is reading it and putting together the TLDR on it for you. Okay. Read those, understand that. And then look at those and go, ah, our product does, does A, B, E, and G. We should talk about that. And point out that you do A, B, G, and E specifically. Why? Because I don't want to have to read through everything and then do my own cross mapping of like, okay, they said they do this one, right? That's one. Like, save me the step. You meet yeah. PRAC3, you meet PRAC4 in NIST. Thank you. You helped me want to now buy your product or at least talk to you about that. So learn the standards. I don't know why people don't. The same thing for the product teams developing it. Right. This feedback should go back to that team and go, hey, listen, if we fully implemented your product. What would it do against this standard? Okay, 
interesting. And funny enough, the second product that Side Channel is building right now, we did this very same approach because I was like out of the gate. I was like, and this is what I got out of my merger was um, access to this other product called Enclave. And it was like, all right, micro segmentation, pretty straightforward, technological underpinning to zero trust concept. Fine. What does it do? And, and immediately I've heard from the original marketing team. Oh, well, blah, blah, blah. I was like, nope, they're gone. When I implement this thing on this device in this network, what exactly does it do against this list? Oh, ding, 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 ding. Good. Start talking about that. Mm -hmm. That's important. Now the product team knows exactly what it does. What does that now? Well, if you're building a product aligned to a framework and that framework is popular in that sector you want to go after or that region, you know, North America versus Europe has ISOs big in Europe, not so much in, in the U.S., if you're going into DOD, you're probably following CMMC or 8171. You can target your space. Well, now the product does these things. Interesting. What else could it do? That's close. Wow, we have three of the five in this category. What do the other two do? Could our product do that? Should we put that on our roadmap? So to me, like building a product now, we're building, a pro we're building products to in this in this fashion because to me it makes the most sense why because i've been a buyer long enough and i know mm -hmm. a ton of my peers you've had you've gotten to know dimitri i know mm -hmm. dimitri's right down the road here like we chat about this about building frameworks and and standards mm -hmm. dimitri thanks for connecting me with danny by the way <laughs> um same thing like he's building programs to, to standards he's looking at products in the same way so what mm -hmm. if product companies start building products to meet those standards, not just the, oh, this is a cool idea or, you know, what can we, so I think that's, I would talk to those vendors first mm -hmm. as a buyer, if they had that information. Why? Because they literally just cut down a whole ton of work for me. Mm -hmm. And I can immediately see, okay, I have to build something to these 10 controls, six controls, whatever it is. Your product does five of those six. I'm interested. That drew me to you. Not your marketing, not whatever, not having me to go through the hoops, that. And I think as the national strategy for the U.S. rolls out, as other standards start really pushing a control look, I think that's going to be a major differentiator for vendors who realize that and start building and marketing that way versus those who don't. Like, why make me do more work? Trying to sell to me, make it easy for me to say, yes, I'm interested. Yeah. What would be some ways that marketers, salespeople, product teams, just vendors in general, uh, could make that experience easier for you. You know, you, you, expl you explained kind of, um, you know, show me how it maps to the particular right. controls and frameworks, but let's get more specific. Give me some, some ways. Is it through digital content, white papers, decks? Oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, take, take. Take that website that you have where you talk about all the cool things and you cite all the statistics from all the different other research papers and remove that and tell me, hey, what type of program do you are you building to? Mm -hmm. Like, okay, here's how we meet the controls inside that framework. And don't just list them and, and then tell me, because inevitably I'm going to go, okay, you listed 20 controls. Now you have to prove it to me. Give me a little, give me a little substance. Our product does, you know, against, so PR, I've always pick on PRAC3. It's uh, in the prioritized NIST CSF. It's the number one control. And the, the control is remote access is managed. Kind of ambiguous. Don't really know how to address it, but can be addressed either way. Tell me exactly how, when you implement your product, you support me being able to say to an auditor, I meet that control. That's the marketer's job. That's the product vendor's job is to give me the answer. That if an auditor walked in here with a black and white mindset, right, or I was being assessed in some way, or a regulator came in, or any third party came in to pressure test my program, I implemented your solution. Give me the answer that I can tell them how I did it with your product. Mm -hmm. You have to tell me that component, right? It's like ghostwrite my response. You know, every product should be telling me that about every control that they're meeting, right? So that I can turn around and go, oh, we use magic widget one, two, three. It does these 10 controls. Let me go through in detail how it does control number one. 
We implement it, it does boom, 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 right? It's effective, it's 24 seven, whatever. Second control, it does this, boom, 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 boom. Now an auditor is gonna sit there and go, oh, interesting. I don't have a case to push back and say, you aren't doing the right thing and you can't prove it because now I've told you something and I can show you the product and how it addresses the gap. And again, not just auditors, but regulators, any third parties, investors, board members, right? It, it's about built, CISOs are building audit ready programs, but not like compliance audits. It's just any third party that's going to ask you. I've sat down in front of board members and they'll, smart ones will ask very specific things and say, hey, how are we addressing this? Right. Like, oh. right. And good CISOs will usually have pre briefings with board members. So they know that they're going to get asked that question because boards don't want to have a game of gotcha right. because CISOs can turn around and make them look really stupid and play that game just as hard. But everybody mm -hmm. does really well by communicating before board meetings. And there we have a good communication and a good conversation to our board. Mm -hmm. But that board member is auditing you on certain things. I can come back and say, hey, listen, great question. This is exactly how we're addressing that risk. Because that's all controls are. Controls are the thing you should do to address the risk. That's mm -hmm. been identified for the reason that the control is published. That, that's all frameworks are. It's just like the output of mm -hmm. risks that are identified and how to address them. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's what I would ask for. Um, 10, 15 years in this industry, still not really seeing it. Like I said, yeah. we, we mapped like 80 products in, in our GRC solution because we have a marketplace where we did this. Because this was a real need. I was like, this is killing me. Mm -hmm. should, we should, let's just jumpstart this. When we sat down with some big vendors, I mean, big vendors in this industry, we're like, if I implemented your product entirely, what would it do against this control framework? I would have expected answers like that. Yeah. Nope. Mm -hmm. Months of meetings with sales engineers, product people to like pull teeth and be like, oh, cool. These are the 22 controls that you actually meet. Great. Glad we know that now. Maybe you should put this in your back pocket and talk to other people like me when they ask. They don't. They don't. It's not an updated thing. It's, nope, yeah. we stopped breaches by 17%. Uh, or 100%. Yeah. That was like, some, of the big, yeah. some of the big ones are going 100%. I'm like, wow. Oh, yeah. Nobody's ever, nobody's ever green across the board. We had a thing in the DOD, and I won't name the... Uh, the service branch that uh, was notorious for doing this, they, they know they do it, but they would come, they would come into briefings and present and they were green across everything. And we'd sit there and be like, no, you're, no, you're not. Nobody is like, that's impossible. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you want to play that game. Good luck. So what are some of the frameworks? Let's kind of list, list them out in terms of priority, in your opinion, that the marketers and salespeople should start reading up on and learning. Yeah, so U.S. based, you know, I, I'm predominantly a North American U.S. centric um, practitioner, right? I, I always have it. So um, it kind of comes down to the 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 space that you're in, right? If you're in a regulated space, that trumps everything. Okay, you know, the SEC rules come out, and you're publicly traded. You have to follow that. You everything else literally doesn't matter until you meet everything. in, in HIPAA is the same way. If you're in healthcare, you have to meet that. So if you're in a regulated space, whatever that is, you do that one. That mm -hmm. is that is your North Star until mm -hmm. you meet it. You want to adopt this, another one after that? Great. But you have to do that one first, okay? Otherwise, fines, wearing orange, you know, that nobody likes that. Um, barring being regulated, again, North American faced, you know, I see a lot of adoption in this CSF, the cybersecurity framework. You see... Um, a lot of folks building good programs based on SOC 2 controls. SOC mm -hmm. 2 has an attestation and all of that. And there's the whole crowd out there that doesn't like it. But really, if you actually read the controls inside of SOC 2, you can build a really good program based on what it's calling for. It's not mm -hmm. terrible. I don't know why people, everyone throws that thing out as if it's this awful thing. It's like, no, you can actually build a pretty good program based on that. You know what you're doing. Um, so, I mean, those are good optional, you know, ones. If you're in the DOD, it's very prescriptive. You know, if you're doing anything inside of the defense industrial base and supporting the U.S. Department of Defense, it's very prescriptive. You have to follow 171. Eventually, you're going to follow CMMC. Um, from there, you know, it's, it's um, I really like CIS. 
the, mm-hmm. the used to be like the top 20, the SANS top 20, now CIS. Now they just call them the controls because they went down to 18. I really like those because they are tactical and operational. Like mm-hmm. they're very like server room level type of activities to go do. And they've got a great tiering within them. So you're like, I'm a small company. I don't need to do all this stuff. They have like that tier, they call them uh, implementation groups, one, two, and three, right? And I really like how they did that because if you're a small firm, say you're a startup, you know, and they do kind of struggle with not being kind of more cloud or SaaS friendly with the controls, but you know, you can basically take what you're looking at and go, Hey, I'm a small, if I did these 20 things or 17 things, so these subgroups, I would have a pretty, pretty decent path and, and structure for a cyber program. Okay. It's a good start. Like adopt that. What's nice about those again is because the folks who are technical can understand those controls and they're prescriptive enough so that it's very detailed on what to go do. The inverse is the problem with bigger frameworks like NIST and ISO. Like, like I said, PRAC3 inside of NIST cybersecurity framework, remote access is managed. That could mean a world difference between you and me on how to meet that, Mm -hmm. right? But that is the control. So there's kind of underlying things. So I always view those controls as good boardroom level controls and have like higher level frameworks to build a program on. But I always like CIS because they're very tactical, Mm -hmm. very operational. So I can talk to the server room folks about how are we implementing DNS security? And I can, you know, and how did we actually implement MFA? Where is it implemented on who? Is it admins or users, remote, not? And then at the, at the boardroom and like at the programmatic level, you know, nobody's asking about DNS security or what exactly we implemented MFA at those conversations. They're asking, hey, do we have all remote access being managed? Yes. Okay. And push comes to shove, I can say, oh, we're doing it because we're doing these three tactical things to support. Mm-hmm. So it, it, where do you want your message being? What does your product do? That's where you kind of want to line up what control framework you meet. And again, North America is going to have a very different one than APEC and Europe and others. You have to look at what is predominant in the region and in the sector. Yep. I love that. This is like the, such a juicy conversation. And I wish I knew this years ago, but it would have helped me dramatically on my website campaigns and, and content. <laughs> so thank you for this. Sure. Um, I want to... I want to have a little bit of fun right now. Not that this wasn't fun or I'm not that I'm, I mean, I have a blast here, but let's, let's get into the, what I call the shit list. And I think okay. you have some, some juicy stories here. I want to know what's the worst thing you've experienced from a vendor. Um, I mean, honestly, the, the number one thing is just a time suck, mm. right? Like just, and I've had this have a couple of times where I'll be like, listen, I said, okay, okay, here's a good one. Right after I got out of DOD and I took over as a CISO for this large insurance carrier, um, I was shopping around for new VARs, value-added resellers, right? Because I needed to establish a relationship. You know, I didn't want to have to continually go out to the market and have to be like, oh, I need this thing. I got to go out on our, like, I wanted to find one vendor and I know how VARs are supposed to work. Be like, great, let me build a good relationship with one. Give them my business. Let them go do all that legwork, right? Mm -hmm. I went through, I thought it was was going to be really nice and easy because these people would be just lining up to get our work, right? We were a Fortune 500 at the time, you know, and I walked into a number of these. The worst one was, I I was like, let's have a whiteboarding session. Here's my strategy, what I want to build over the next three years. And I laid it all out on a whiteboard, what I want to go build. I want to, you know, in year one, this area, I want to build this. I need to implement this type of a SOC 24 seven. I want to actually use some open source solutions. I laid out the whole thing because I basically took what I had done at Pentagon and now wanted to bring it into this insurance carrier, which is why I was hired, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Not to build them, replicate Pentagon, you know, security, but take the same type of thinking. And the, it wasn't the first vendor. It was the second one I sat down with. And I did this whole whiteboarding session. I was like, all right, I'm literally giving you the map on how to sell to me. Like, I need these areas. And I keep looking over here because I have a whiteboard over here. But like, just have it. What, what, what can I do here, here, and here? Pull together some ideas. 
come back to me, you know, with this. We spent like four hours, like white, like me whiteboarding the strategy. A couple of days later, I get, you know, a call and a follow up. Let's sit down and go over this. They didn't present anything out of my, my strategy. All they presented me with was the things that made them the most margin that they sold a lot of, and they were good at selling. And I was like, and I, and I knew what they were good at selling and I knew what they, what they had, because that was why they were recommended to me because they were able to do all these other, these major areas. And I was like, oh, very, okay. They get it. They know they, they're going to have leverage. I'm going to get a good deal. And they like, it's as if I didn't spend that four hours going over exactly what it is I needed. And they just said, cool, that's great that that's what you want. But here's what we want to sell you. I was like, so yeah, that was terrible. That was terrible. And I went and the very next vendor, no, it wasn't the next one. It was the one after that I talked to. I did build a relationship because he sat down and listened to me. I walked through everything and he was like, okay. And he came back and was like, listen, I need a little bit more detail about what is it you really want here in step one? Mm -hmm. what do you want to accomplish? What type of product? Can I bring you like two or three? Can we like look at a bunch of them? Like, let's, I want to make sure I really understand what it is you're looking for. I was like, oh, good. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. He won my business. Yeah. Because he took the time to actually understand what it is I wanted, not what he was good at selling. Right. Apart from that, what's one thing that a vendor has done that has made you feel good? Um, I mean, the, the, the follow through on things, cause you know, we kind of wave hands at like, it's about relationships. It is like, I don't want to be friends with these people. We're, mm -hmm. we're this is a business, mm -hmm. but I also want to get to know you. I, I kind of want to get to better understand, you know, what's on the horizon. You know, if, if, if it's just transactional, I'm paying you to give me the widget and now I got the widget and it's over fine. Let's mm -hmm. call it what it is. Okay. But don't, don't call me a partner if that's what the relationship is. The good ones are ones who are going, Hey, I know you're using that. I saw some really cool things going on with this other tech that you should probably take a look at. Have you heard about it? You know, be my eyes and ears, right? Yeah. Bring some other information in because as much as I read and I will tell you, I read nonstop. I love mm -hmm. sucking up information about what's going on in the industry and around the industry. But, you know, I can't be privy to everything. Right. So people who really are like, hey, listen, I, I really don't want you just as a customer. I want to really support what you're doing with your mission and what you're building. That's mm -hmm. important to me as a vendor to you. Mm -hmm. That type of relationship is awesome, right? And that's what I really, and I've gotten that out of, out of a few yeah. who were kind of looking around the corner and going, hey, there's this other thing you maybe want to check out. Right. I've had people even say, listen, like we don't even resell that. Like, we're not even selling that thing, but I saw it and I thought of Brian because that's what he talked about wanting to build. Could right. this be useful for him? Mm -hmm. Those are the people I call back. Those are the people I know after I leave that job and I call and I want to reestablish a relationship at the next company. Right. I love it. This has been an absolute pleasure. We're heading towards the end of the session and I do want to ask you one more question. Is there anything you'd like to impart on the audience today before we sign off? If you want to be in this industry, buckle up, um, know what you're getting into. You know, I can tell you at 31, when I took over the program I did at DOD, I was young, but I'm very excited. And when I took over being the CISO for Fortune 500 at 35, I was excited and scared um, because not because of what I was walking into, but because I had hit the pinnacle role at such a young age that I thought what else to go do. Mm. And I think the piece I embark out of learning and going through that is if you want to be a CISO, great. Take your time before you get to that because the better prepared you are before you take that role on, the much more effective you'll be. There mm -hmm. really is no rush to go hit that, that job. You know, there's plenty of other things you can go do. And I've mentored a lot of people who've been very just like, I want it, I want that role. And I'm always just like, why now? Right. Like, there's so much more you can learn so that when you do get that job, you will be just kicking so much ass. Mm -hmm. Why do it now and be okay? When yeah. you can, so, and I, I think that's, you have time to learn and to go do and, and grow. Mm -hmm. 
don't rush it because mm-hmm. I think you will not be effective. And you'll see guys like me at conferences when you're trying to like flounder go, I mean, come on now, right? I think there's a big difference between people who have the experience going into roles like that. So look, you're out of college, you're listening to this, you're mid-career, you want that next job, great. I, I like people who swing for the fences, but take your time, grow mm-hmm. while you can and, and wait for it. You know, I, I, I think that's a big thing that gets missed on people. Everyone's charging for like getting there right now. And it's like, okay. Learn a little bit more first. Love it. Love it. Where can people find you, Brian? Uh, you can find me anywhere on LinkedIn, Brian Hoagley, um, or via sidechannel.com. That is our company. And uh, yeah, um, actually in October, I just got asked to give the keynote for the ISSA conference down in North Carolina in nice. October 20th. So Amazing. that's the next uh, keynote or that I get to go give, which is, I, I was very honored. I just accepted that yesterday. So if anybody's in the North Carolina area in the triangle, I guess they call it October 20th, you can uh, catch me down there, but yeah, anywhere on LinkedIn, happy to chat with people on there. Uh, Danny, thanks so much for having me on. This has been a great combo. Well, you are always welcome to the show. Thank you. Love All to right. be back. Take care, Brian. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Audience First. If you like what you've heard, feel free to follow or subscribe to Audience First on Apple, Spotify, or any of your favorite podcast streamers.